Okay. Hello and welcome everybody. And thanks for joining us at the webinar today. This is the top security tips for managing a remote workplace. Uh, we've got some really great tips today for you guys uh, from a special guest and also the BenQ Australia team. Uh, my name's Dan. I look after marketing at BenQ Australia here based in Sydney. And I've got my uh, colleagues here with me as well, uh, Bajoy and Jai, who I'll introduce a little bit later. So uh, first, uh, first of all, like I said, thanks so much for everybody uh, joining us today and uh, let's get kicked off. So let's go a little bit into the agenda just quickly, just to let you know uh, what's on the cards today. So first of all, we'll have uh, some top security tips from John Bigelow from Security Solutions, a little bit more about John in a couple of seconds. Uh, we'll have the security features of BenQ InstaShow uh, and a little bit about DuoBoard from Bijoy uh, Babu, who is uh, the projector product manager, which is on uh, sitting to my right. And we'll next we'll have a quick demo of InstaShow, uh, just how the button kit works and a few of the key features there. And at the end, we'll have a Q&A. So if at any time throughout the presentation, please feel free to add your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll, we'll stop at the end for a Q&A and we'll get through uh, all your questions and we'll do our best to, to answer. So we'll have John on board uh, from Security Solutions and we'll also have the BenQ Australia team to help with answering those questions. So without further ado, I just want to introduce you to John Bigelow. So John is the editor of Security Solutions, Australasia's leading security source for business, government and security, uh, security industries. For over 20 years, John has written for a wide range of security issues from cybersecurity, physical security, terrorism, national security and more. In addition to presenting at both local in and international events, John provides expert commentary for both television and radio and is the host of Australia's security, sorry, the Australian Security Industry Association's podcast called Security Insider. Uh, John, we really, really appreciate you being, being here today and um, thanks for taking the time. And it's my pleasure and thank you very much for having me. So, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for coming along today and joining our podcast. Uh, I guess what we want to do is we want to get into um, some of the nuts and bolts around what it takes to run a remote workforce safely from home. Uh, obviously, last 12 months were a, a somewhat chaotic 12 months with everyone having to suddenly transition from uh, a work from the office type environment to a work from home type environment. And that presented a couple of security challenges because it happened so quickly. We went from, you know, business as normal in January to all of a sudden business working from home in March. And a lot of companies weren't set up for it. When we're working in the office, we're obviously working in a uh, protected bubble where we've got a trusted network. We've got IT security managers. Um, we have uh, virus and anti uh, malware, well, sorry, malware and antivirus software protecting us and all those sorts of things. However, when we're working from home, we're outside of that trusted bubble and that creates some challenges. So to kick this off, let's have a look at a couple of the myths and misconceptions around cybersecurity. Because what we get is we get a lot of people thinking, oh, well, no one would ever want to hack me. I'm just, you know, uh, John Bigelow. No, who could possibly want to hack me? Well, the reality is you're both right and wrong at the same time. No individual wants to hack you. But the old uh, misconception of people being hackers, sitting in the basement, typing away on their computer, looking for people that they can break into, doing nefarious things. That's really not the case. What tends to happen these days is most online cybercrime is bots that are just trawling the internet. So if we put this in a physical security context, instead of having burglars walking up and down the street, trying to hack into your house or trying to get into your house by shaking doors and windows, what you've got is automated bots just flying around like drones, checking every single possible place that they can get into. So the reality is, you're right, no individual wants to hack you, but you are still a target. And to understand the scale of, of how this works, let's have a quick look at some statistics. So cybercrime statistics, 
A cyber attack is attempted every 39 seconds. Last year, 700 million people in 21 countries experienced some form of cybercrime. The damage related to cybercrime is projected to hit $6 trillion annually by the end of this year. Ransomware attacks rose by 148% in March last year, and we will get to what ransomware is if you're not sure about that. Cloud-based attacks jumped by 630% between January and April, April last year, and two in five small to medium-sized businesses have been the victim of some sort of ransomware attack. So as you can see, what that actually means for you is that it's not about an individual trying to hack you, it's about the overall picture of cybercrime and how they're just targeting any opportunity that they possibly can. And one last statistic here, you know, phishing attempts have increased by more than 660% since the 1st of March last year. So I'm sure you can see that there's some pretty significant statistics there backing up what it is that we're actually talking about. So let's go through those and have a look at some of those challenges. As we mentioned before, when you're working in that safe work environment, we're surrounded by IT professionals who are there to look after things, make sure the antivirus protection is in place, making sure the malware stuff is in place, making sure that people can't get into our office network. But the reality is when we leave that office network, our home office tends to look a little bit more like this, where we don't have all of those safeguards and safety measures. And so from that point of view, there's a couple of basic housekeeping things that I want to run through. And, and we're going to start this with what really is simple housekeeping stuff, but it's important and a lot of people forget to do it. When you sign up with an internet service provider, you will get a modem router that tends to look something like this. And on the bottom of that modem router, you will see something like this, which is a default username and password. The reality is the vast majority of people who end up signing up, whether it be with Telstra or Optus or TPG or whoever that gets sent a modem router to their house to connect to the internet, never change those default usernames and passwords. Now, of course, the problem with that is there are a host of online websites that publish these things. Now, again, it doesn't necessarily mean if you don't change it, someone's instantly gonna be able to hack into your, your home internet connection, but what you're doing is you're making it that one bit easier for them. Just like if you go away on holidays and you have a two-story house and you leave the ladder out in the yard, that doesn't necessarily mean someone's gonna climb up the ladder and break into your upstairs window, but you're making it that little bit easier for them. So. We need to go in and change that default username and password as a first step in improving remote workforce security. If you're working from home, get the basics sorted, which also brings us to number two on the list, password security. And I'm sure we've all been guilty of this at some point in the past, using crappy passwords that make it super easy for anyone to get into your computer. I know it's hard to remember a different password for every single site that you go to, but using the same password for everything is one of the worst things that you can possibly do because it only means that a cyber criminal needs to get that one password to get into everything. Even worse is using simple passwords and we all do it. You know, we use QWERTY or one, two, three, four, five. And in fact, to give you an example of, of why that's a terrible idea, here is the top 1,000 passwords used around the world as published on multiple different websites. And these sorts of programs that you're looking at now, or this particular website, this forms the basis for what they call brute force attacks, where you know cyber groups out of Russia and China and all sorts of people will just load those top 1,000 passwords into uh, a bot. And when that bot hits on your IP address and it sees that there might be a vulnerability, it just starts blasting out those passwords one after the other, after the other, after the other, until eventually it gets in. So we need to have strong passwords that consist of alphanumeric characters and different passwords for every site. And you know, if you uh, if you can't remember what what passwords for what and all the rest of it, there's some really great password manager programs out there, and they're dead cheap. You know, things like uh, LastPass or Password Vault or a multitude of others. And you're talking a few dollars a month 
maybe a hundred dollars a year to subscribe to one of them. It'll generate really strong passwords for you. It will keep them all in a vault for you. Everything's simple. And all you need to remember is the master password, which is super hard to hack to get into that password vault. And then all the rest of it's secure and you can get to it from devices, tablets, laptops, whatever. So good password security. This is just basic hygiene stuff. And of course, the next one is not installing threat protection software. And that means antivirus software. It means malware software, and even sometimes whistleblowing software, which will tell you when someone's trying to do something dodgy on your computer. And these are all usually brought together under one package. And it's you know pretty simple to install and run. I know people think, oh, I don't need to install that. I've got Windows Defender. Well, with all due respect to Microsoft, if you run Windows, Windows Defender is nothing more than speed hump to people that do these sorts of things. Same with Mac. I run Macs personally and people think, oh, I don't need to run antivirus software. I've got a Mac. You know, no one writes viruses for Macs. Well, yeah, they do. I can't tell you the number of word macro viruses I've had trapped trying to come through my antivirus software onto my Mac. So Absolutely, you need antivirus and malware software. And there's a whole range of different manufacturers out there that do all sorts of different things. But the problem is without it, what you're doing is, remember the analogy we used before about someone walking down the street and rattling doors and all the rest of it? You've basically, without antivirus software, you've built a house and you've put no locks on any of the doors or windows. And so you've now got our criminal walking down the street checking out what's going on on the uh, information superhighway, having a look into your computer and thinking, hmm, what's in there that I can possibly get my hands on? And again, you know, it's not hard. Kaspersky, uh, McAfee, Norton, Bitdefender, Webroot, along with billions of others. There's tons of these programs out there. Install one, run one, and set it to auto-update. Make sure that you let it update all of the time so that you're not getting behind in virus definitions. It's always patched. It's always up to date. And that goes for your operating system as well, whether you're running Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, whatever you're doing, always, always, always install those updates, even if it's a pain in the bum. Keep it up to date because that's what stops people from being able to get into your system. The other reason that it's so important to have these sorts of virus protection packages or malware protection packages on your computer is because it protects you from attacks like this particular one we're gonna talk about now. If you ever wake up and turn your computer on and find that message, that's the beginning of a very, very bad day. This is what we call a ransomware attack. And I'm sure by now you've all heard of it, but ransomware attacks are basically where cyber criminals manage to find their way onto your computer through a range of different mechanisms, either you've installed a piece of software and given it admin privileges and you weren't quite sure what it did, or you've opened an email or clicked on something else, but they've now got access and they've encrypted all of your files. And usually they will ask anywhere from $1,000 to hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on the size of the business, to give you that decryption key. You'll have to pay via Bitcoin to an anonymous website and it's just a mess. You really, really don't want to have to do it. So the question then becomes, how do we prevent ransomware attacks? Well, there's a couple of ways that we can do this. Number one, keep your operating system patched and up to date to ensure you have fuel vulnerabilities. We spoke about that a second ago. Don't install software or give it administration privileges unless you know exactly what it is and what it does. So where people run afoul of this is they might be looking to try and uh, convert an image, like they want to create a cool GIF or something from a, a photo. So they go online and they find an image converter. They don't know where it's come from. They don't know what it does. They just know that it's free. They can download it. It'll do the job. And they have to give it admin privileges to the computer to enable it to work. That's a bad idea. Unless you know exactly what the program is doing and where it's from, never allow something admin privileges over your computer. It's essentially the same as unlocking your front door and just giving the guy standing out the front the keys. Install antivirus software. We've already spoken about that. We know that that's super important. And of course, this is the important one for ransomware. Back up your files regularly. If you're backing up your files, at least every day, then you have a fighting chance that if someone encrypted your files today, you can revert back to the backup from yesterday. 
you know, the system that I use is I have two separate backup disks that I run uh, and I run them on odd and even days. So I'll run a backup on a Monday. I'll run a separate backup on a Tuesday. I'll go back to Monday's backup on Wednesday. So that, that way, if I get a ransomware attack, I can go back to yesterday. And if that one's infected, I can go back to the day before. It's probably a little extreme. You don't necessarily have to go to that length, but make sure you have some sort of backup. And they're, they're automated, they're simple. Apple Runtime Capsule, Android have their own thing, Google have one as well. And, and just about any external hard drive you buy from Officeworks or JB Hi-Fi or Harvey Norman will have some sort of software on it that lets you automate backups. So that's really important. So from there, what we're gonna talk about next is one of the most common forms of social engineering attacks that pretty much the vast majority of cybercrime encompasses. And of course, we're talking about phishing. Now, for those of you who don't know what phishing is, let's have a look at this quick short video that'll tell you a little bit more about phishing. The goal of phishing is to trick an email recipient into believing that the message is something they want or need. A request from their bank, for instance, or a note from someone in their company, and to click a link or download an attachment. Fish is pronounced just like it's spelled, which is to say like the word fish. The analogy is of an angler throwing a baited hook out there, the fishing email, and hoping you bite. <laughs> what really distinguishes phishing is that attackers masquerade as a trusted entity of some kind, often a real or plausibly real person, or a company the victim might do business with. It might be your boss, your bank, or a company whose software you use. Perhaps one of the most consequential phishing attacks in history happened in 2016, when Russian hackers managed to get Hillary Clinton's campaign chair, John Podesta, to offer up the password to his personal Gmail account. How did they do it? The hacker sent an email warning Mr. Podesta that someone had his password and that he should change it immediately. Clicking on a link in the email took him to a fake login page. This is a classic ploy and one all of us would hope we would see for what it is. But email scammers are constantly honing their craft, trying new pitches and pulling new strings. One way to get familiar with their tactics is to study the email messages that scammers send. Here are a few real world examples and how they work. One, your account has been hacked. The person sending this threatening phishing message found a group email that was publicly available on the company site. Using that list to target the message was smart. Not so smart was the content of the message, in which the would-be attacker reveals a lack of understanding of how malware works. Two, password reset. Taking advantage of the fact that no one wants to miss a paycheck, messages like this one aim to trick the user into revealing important data often a username and password that the attacker can use to reach a system or account. Three, payment request. This email has enough information specific to the target company to give even the most phishing savvy recipients pause. The key to not getting caught in this trap is to know your company's processes and to be able to spot anomalies. Four, charity donation. Here the scammer is counting on the greed and gullibility of the recipient. This theme of giving something away for free is a common one and preys on human nature. The key thing to remember is if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Thanks for watching and stay safe out there. So that's a little bit about phishing and there's, there's three different kinds of phishing that we really need to be aware of. The first one, which is general phishing, is a, an email campaign, a social engineering campaign that's just blasted out to anyone and everyone in the hopes that someone will respond to it. Then you've got spear phishing, which is a much more targeted form of phishing, uh, where they're generally looking for specific people within an organisation who hold uh, positions that would allow them information or access to information, finances, things like that. So stuff like finance managers, C-suite level people and all the rest of it. And believe it or not, they get this information from places like LinkedIn, where they go in and they run position description searches. They find people within certain organisations. Sometimes those people even list their email address on their LinkedIn uh, contact details. And it's like, great, I can send you a, if you're the finance manager, I'm going to send you a dummy invoice from a bank or whatever it may be. And then there's business email compromise or Beck attacks, which is again, a much more highly targeted focused form of phishing, which is designed 
uh, to look like uh, one of your adver- one of your customers' invoices to trick you into paying to a different account or one of your clients' emails or whatever it may be. And again, usually targeted at finance managers and those sorts of things. And I say this because when you, if you're in one of those positions and you're working from home, it's not necessarily always easy to just check with a colleague, hey, this is your customer. Is this normal? Is this what you do? So the best defense against phishing attacks is training. Training, training, and more training. You need to understand what a phishing attack looks like, what a dodgy email looks like, what a, uh, a fraudulent invoice looks like. So if your company doesn't have training in place, then you need to put some sort of training in place. I would recommend it. Or you can go online and do some research and really find out a couple of things around, you know, how do I know what a dodgy email looks like? And how do I know if my computer has been compromised? Knowing whether or not your device has been compromised is just as important as understanding what a malicious email might look like. Because if your computer starts doing things and you don't recognize the signs and symptoms, you could go on for days or even weeks or sometimes even months in some cases with that compromise on the computer operating in the background, taking all sorts of data without you knowing about it. So what does a compromise look like? Well, let's have a look at the six signs and symptoms that you've been compromised. And there's a lot more than this, but these are the main ones. So number one, you get a ransomware message. That was that email message that we saw before. Anything like that that tells you that the files have been locked or whatever, that's, you don't really need to learn that. That's going to be pretty obvious. When someone gets that, it's like, oh, okay, bad day. Um, you get a fake antivirus message. So if you're getting virus pop-ups or virus warning pop-ups on your computer from software that you haven't installed saying, we've detected a virus, you need to do something about it now, click this link, don't. Don't click any links that you don't know where they've come from. You have unwanted browser tools. So our browser is, you know, the little toolbar at the bottom, um, either on a Mac or a PC, doesn't matter. It's usually in the same place. If you start seeing symbols down there for programs that you didn't install, shut your computer down immediately and take it either to the IT manager at the office or to your local computer shop or to a trusted friend or an IT pro, someone who knows what they're doing, but that's usually a bad sign. It may be innocuous, but get it checked. Uh, your internet searches get redirected. So you might be looking for the latest BenQ interactive flat panel. You type in BenQ and you end up at, you know, um, whatever it is, you know, an ad for underwear or something else. And you keep typing in BenQ and you keep ending up on a different website. Again, a typical sign that you've been hacked. You see frequent random pop-ups, right? Most operating systems now have pop-up blockers built into them unless you've turned it off. So, you know, random pop-ups for strange things that you didn't necessarily look at or you don't want to know about. And again, it's often antivirus software. It's trying to, you know, pretend that it's detected a problem and it's alerting you to it. Anything like that, get it checked. And number six, your friends receive social media invitations from you that you didn't send. And equally importantly, you receive or they receive emails from you that you didn't send, which means it's often gotten into your address book and it's trying to self-perpetuate. A lot of these uh, virus programs work by getting into your contacts and your addresses and sending themselves out to as many people as they possibly can in the hope that people will click on that funny GIF that you sent them or click on that funny soundbite that you sent them, which then installs the malware into their computer as well. So if you start getting calls from people going, hey, dude, did you send me this weird email? Dead set sign, you have been hacked. So again, same process, shut the computer down immediately, take it to the IT manager at the office, take it to your local computer rep, whatever you have to do, get it checked. So we've spoken about the signs and symptoms and how to know whether or not you've been hacked, right? You've been lucky so far. It doesn't seem like you've been hacked. Coronavirus is starting to get back to normal. We're sort of heading back to more where we were at the beginning of last year. And, you know, a lot of people are now heading back to the office. We're working with colleagues and friends. We're sharing information with each other. But again, the reality is you've been out of the office now for anywhere from six to seven months. No one knows where that computer's been. You don't know what people have surfed on, what they haven't surfed and looked at and all the rest of it. So how do we know we can trust that device back in our office network? You plug it in and if that computer's been infected, it has free reign across the entire network. 
And that may be the opportunity that it's waiting for. So there's a couple of different ways that you can reintegrate into your office network um, without potentially compromising the office network. And this is going to be an ongoing thing probably for the next few years, if not longer. You know, I imagine in light of what's happened in the last 12 months, it's unlikely that everyone in every office is going to go back to the office full time. You're going to get people who are going to be in the office a couple of days a week, working from home a couple of days a week. So, you know, devices going into and out of that trusted network all the time. Now, what do you do? Do you get the IT manager to scan every, or the IT team to scan every device every time it comes back into the office network to see that it's safe? It's probably unrealistic. So what we need to do is we need to find a way that we can share information, collaborate, work with our customers, work with our guests without necessarily making the office network vulnerable. Now, there's a couple of different ways that you can do that, but one of the easiest ways is screencasting. And of course, a multitude of companies do this now. Apple uh, have built in AirPlay, uh, Google have Chromecast. Um, but the problem with these solutions, and there's a multitude of others, there's Vivi and all sorts of people, but the problem with a lot of these solutions is that they're, they're one way. They, they're what we call dumb solutions because they can only do one thing at a time. Oh, that's why my wife keeps saying that I'm dumb. But anyway, that's a different story. Um, what we want is we want a slightly smarter solution that can do multiple things. And one of the ones that I particularly like is the, uh, the Insta Show from Ben Q. It, I've had a look at this on a couple of different occasions now. We've done some stories with some schools who are using this type of device. Uh, there's a couple of companies that we've worked with who are using this. And I'll tell you why I like this particular device from a security point of view. First of all, the, uh, the BenQ Insta Show is a hardware-based solution. So there are no drivers necessary. Now, remember, any notes that you take here, Bajoy, who's the, the product manager after this, he's going to be able to answer all your questions. I'm just going to run through the things that I like about this solution. It's hardware-based, which means there's no drivers, no software. So it's a lot less mucking around. You don't have to install stuff on the computer. It's literally plug and play, as opposed to other solutions that require drivers and become plug and pray, and it's a nightmare. Secondly, it features super strong security. We've got WAP2 authentication protocols, AES 128-bit encryption, which to my knowledge has not yet been cracked, um, as well as being CVSS compliant. And for those of you who want to know, CVSS is Common Vulnerability Scoring System. It's a free and open industry standard for addressing or assessing the severity uh, of a computer system's security vulnerabilities. So it complies with that as well. So it's really strong security. It uses proprietary algorithms for streaming of video. This is an important one uh, because often when we're doing stuff on our laptops or our computers and we're working in a collaborative environment, it involves some element of security. And a lot of these uh, devices that are out there now just use standard streaming engines. BenQ have developed their own proprietary streaming engine specifically for streaming video and I've seen it working, it's fantastic. Uh, it's a multi-person presentation tool. What I mean by that is with AirPlay or something like AirPlay, if I'm sharing my computer screen to the board, I'm the only person who can do that at that time. With the InstaShare, we can have 10 people sitting around a boardroom table sharing a screen like a duo board, for example. Everyone can have an InstaShare device plugged into their laptop and they can swap between computers. You just push the button on the InstaShare and now you're the one sharing. And then someone else can push the button on their computer and they can chime in and they can show what they're doing. So it gives you that multi-person solution, which I really, really like. This again is that, that multi-person presentation that we were talking about. And you can see down the bottom here, you've got all the different Insta shows plugged into the various different laptops where people jump from computer to computer. It just makes it that much easier to collaborate. And of course, when you're using it with the Duo board, it gives you a range of other different options and features that I'm sure uh, Bajoy will go through later on, but it just, it, it becomes a two-way package. There's a lot more that you can do when you're using the flat panel with the Insta show, including things like annotation and other bits and pieces that we'll get to in a second. But the thing that's also great about it is that it's guest friendly. So if you've got people coming into your office, that same security thing that we were talking about before, where it's like, well, we don't know where they've been. They're a guest. They're coming into our office. We don't know what their security protocols are like. We don't know what kind of trusted systems they've been on or non-trusted systems. And, you know, I don't necessarily want to go asking our guests to our office, oh, can you please install these drivers or this security before we let you on our network? I mean, we're not ASIO. Then again, they might be listening. Who knows? Um, 
So you just plug the Insta show in and bang, away you go. They're up and running on your network. They can share everything with you. So they're the main points that I like about the Insta show. And again, when you combine it with the duo board, there's a bunch of different things that it can do. For example, uh, the interactive panels are embedded with McAfee software. So again, that makes the duo board a lot, lot uh, more robust because it can't it's not exposed to those viruses and malware and has the whistleblowing software in it and all the other things that we were talking about before. It features Duo OS, which is great because it means it's compatible with anything from devices to computers. It's not, it's not brand agnostic. It doesn't matter whether you're on a Mac or a Chromebook or a Windows machine or a Linux machine, it'll work on anything. Uh, and that annotation software that we spoke about before is great because when I'm sharing something from my laptop up to the screen on the Insta show, people can use easy write software on the duo board to annotate over it. It's all saved up to the cloud. They'll go through all this with you later on. But my point is from a security point of view, this is a really, really good way to collaborate. Two-way mirroring in certain situations. And I'm sure the guys will explain that to you, but a lot of the other devices are one way. It goes from the laptop to the device and that's all it'll do. When you use the duo board and the Insta show in conjunction with each other, it facilitates two-way mirroring, which I'll, I'll let the team at BenQ explain to you. And lastly, germ resistant, which is pretty important during this coronavirus pandemic. You know, using a, a multi-layer coating of non-toxic enduring nano-ionic silver agent that kills most germs uh, accumulating on the screen on contact and prevents cross-contamination. So when you've got multiple people using a touch board or an interactive panel, that's a pretty handy feature from a security point of view because you're not risking the safety of staff. So what have we learned today? In summary, we want to change our home modem router's default password. We want to install and maintain antivirus and malware protection. I know this is kind of housekeeping stuff, but it's important. And if you haven't done it, when you get off this, you need to go and do it. Use strong passwords and even better, a password manager if you can. Back up regularly and at the very least, if not daily, every second day, but I, I would set it to do it every couple of hours at the least. It'll protect you from those ransomware attacks to some degree. It'll be the best thing you ever do. And of course, put in place training for staff so that they know how to spot a malicious attack or signs of a breach. And employ technology designed to allow staff to return the office safe, to the office safely and securely without risking the office network. So... It's not a high level discussion for systems into information officers talking about, you know, threat vectors and the latest virus attacks and all the rest of it. This is hygiene stuff. I hope you've gotten something out of it. I hope it's been useful. You know, the guys at BenQ will tell you a little bit more about their products and why they're perfect for this kind of application. But uh, if you've got any questions, let's throw over to that now. Thanks so much, John. Uh, look, really, some really, really great information there. And, and yes, it, it sort of went right from the, the end user or the, the employee all the way up to the ICT manager even uh, to, to help get those devices that have been brought home and maybe compromised back into the office safely. So thanks so much for taking the time and, and sharing your knowledge with us. And, and as John mentioned, uh, he'll be hanging out towards the end to answer any questions you might have in the Q&A. So please uh, drop any questions you've got into the Q&A box. So uh, I might now uh, invite uh, Bijoy Babu. Uh, he is the um, projector uh, product manager, specifically looking after the InstaShow product. He's just going to do a quick presentation on a, a little bit more about uh, the security features of InstaShow in particular. Yeah, thanks, Dan, and thanks, John, for taking us through. Honestly speaking, it looks a bit scary, <laughs> but I guess that's that's the world out there. And it's it's it just depends on us of how we uh, look into all these sort of attacks and and how we find let's say find solutions for them. So um, I'll just be taking you through just let's say a few of the security features that's there on the BenQ Insta Show, which John would have just shown of what the products are capable of doing and the latest security feature on the smart projector. So. Uh, InstaShow, as most of you are aware, is BenQ's wireless presentation solution, which uh, is uh, which has been in the market for quite some time. And uh, one of InstaShow's best 
feature is its level of encryption that you see. So uh, InstaShow, let's say the WDC 20. So we mainly have two models, the WDC 10 and the WDC 20. And the WDC 20 boasts of having a three level encryption, which makes it very robust against any sort of malware at attacks or in anything that you saw from John's presentation. The, the next attribute that makes InstaShow really special is its capability of not interfering with a company's network, which basically isolates itself, which in turn gives an extra security to your company network. So for example, like the way how John said, like when you come back to your office from your home environment, there are chances that your system might be, uh, let's say encrypted or having some sort of a virus attack on it. And this feature from InstaShow probably would prevent your office network from being attacked when you are trying to cast your content wirelessly. One other new feature from the InstaShow category is that we at BenQ are always trying to put a product or give a product to third party laboratories that can look into different vulnerability features on the InstaShow. So the vulnerability assessment certification that you see here is something which is done pretty much the last year from a third party agency called Onward Security. So Onward Security is actually an ISO 27001 certified agency, which generally looks into the vulnerability aspect or how easy is it to crack the uh, WPA2 uh, password or that sort of encryption within the product. So it generally tests a lot of IT hardware and softwares for this, this particular reason. So these are the certificates that were being issued by Onward Security, which basically shows InstaShow is pretty much having zero vulnerabilities. And it's not, or let's say the chances of someone attacking the InstaShow system is very low. Secondly, in terms of cracking the WPA2 password that comes within the InstaShow system or the encryption that's there, so there are chances where someone can even crack into your WPA2 security key that you just made. So uh, the onboard security laboratory hasn't been able to crack that, which makes it even uh, less vulnerable to such attacks. So uh, these, all these encryptions or all these certifications are being based on the CVSS, what we call as common vulnerability scoring system which is also a third party system, which typically is being used to assess the vulnerability and how safe is an IT hardware or software to be used in a corporate environment. And uh, this is one of our latest certification that's there on the InstaShow product. So which in turn can be one of our key USBs too. Uh, speaking of the smart projector security feature. So the latest, update on the smart projector, both the E600 and the E800 series gives you accessibility to install McAfee uh, antivirus through the BenQ Suggest App Store. So uh, this, on the other hand, also helps, let's say when you connect a USB directly through to the projector or when you try accessing a, a particular URL link through the projector, the McAfee tries to block if there's any sort of attack that can come out of any of these uh, devices. And the next is the security feature that's there on Duoboard, which Dan will speak of. Thanks, Bajoy. Uh, just, just a quick one on Duoboard. Uh, exact, exactly the same way as Smart Projector works with Android is also how it works with Duoboard. So uh, being pre-installed with the McAfee software if you're in the Android environment, but probably more importantly uh, uh, for for the IT managers and, and security professionals is that the duo board comes with a built-in OPS PC, which is running Windows. So that obviously opens up a whole plethora of different options for antivirus and obviously locking down networks and ports and things like that. Something that uh, John mentioned earlier about some of those antivirus programs. So you, you open up to the whole Windows uh, ecosystem when it comes to security. So what we might do now is just do a very quick demo of the Insta Show. I'll uh, throw you over to Jai. We'll go on the roaming camera, and uh, we'll we'll check out how the button kit works. Uh, you're on, you're on. 
Cool. G'day guys. Hope you're all doing well. We'll just get this roaming camera set up. Um, we've spoken a lot about the security of uh, InstaShow. We're just going to go over a couple of um, great user features um, that will help out with your presentations and so forth now. Um, you can see on Dan's camera here, we've just got a, a simple laptop connected to our button kit. Uh, each InstaShow kit comes with two of these button kits in the holder that you can see here. And this is just connected via USB for power to power that button kit and obviously HDMI there so we can cast our um, audio and video straight straight from the, the button kit to our panel. Um, we have the host unit of the InstaShow hooked up to our RPO2 series here, which is an interactive flat panel. And it's as easy as just pressing the button on the button kit to cast directly from our laptop straight up to the screen there. But Joy, we're working on a USB-C button kit at the moment. Do we have a, a rough estimate on when that yeah, will be so available? The USB-C connector for the WDC probably will come the next quarter. It's okay. So around Q2, Q3 yeah, so Q2 this year. Beautiful. And, and so that will work in a similar way, but instead of having a USB-A and HDMI connection, it'll just be one connection through USB-C. Obviously, our laptops and devices uh, are taking on board that USB-C uh, connectivity these days, and we want to be able to support that with our um, InstaShow. So this is an InstaShow um, WDC20, which is our latest unit. It's the unit that we've been talking about predominantly today as well. And this is connected to our panel, um, and it brings with it a, a couple of really cool new features too. So previously with our InstaShow, we've been able to cast one device at a time to our panel. And now we actually have a split screen feature, which allows us to cast multiple laptops, but also from our own mobile devices as well. If I just disconnect this device here, just briefly, Dan, we'll just show them this, this home screen of the, the host here. And so this is obviously just on a HDMI connection here, a source connection. And you can see here that we have our own network and our own password to connect directly to the host from our mobile devices or tablets. Um, obviously, with the button kits, we don't plug those into our mobile phones or tablets. And so we can just join this network like we do with any other network and be able to start casting. So I've already joined that network on my mobile phone, which is an iPhone, and I can just use the AirPlay protocol here to cast directly to the panel. And this will end up casting exactly what we see on my mobile phone there. And you can see that on screen now. And this is working in real time, obviously, too. And then I can connect another device and we go into split screen. And we can support up to four devices currently um, using this technology. So it can be a combination of those button kits for our, for our computers and also um, our mobile phones and tablets. And um, this will all work in real time too. Now, if I disconnect my phone here, I'm just gonna go full screen on our Windows laptop here. The other great thing about the WDC20 is that it allows and supports touchback now. And what that actually means is, is that I can control my laptop that I'm casting directly from an interactive flat panel um, itself via a touch cable that just runs straight into the back of the panel there. And so I can navigate through my laptop without being anchored to that laptop and just use this as a, as a huge touch monitor for that computer connected. So it's a really handy feature and something that was missing from our initial WDC 10 unit. Um, the other thing we might discuss, um, Dan, is just some of the connectivity that's plugged in here as well. So if we can just show the host unit really quickly, I just want to talk about some of the cables that we're running from our host unit. So the host unit has four antennas now for um, better reception and, and transmission there. And we just have a, a USB-A uh, cable here, which allows that touchback functionality for our Windows laptop. Obviously next to that running to the right, we have a HDMI cable. And then that cream colored cable there, you'll notice there's a LAN cable. And so this allows internet access um, to our network. So you can imagine when we connect our mobile devices, we're connecting to the Wi-Fi unit of the, of the, the WDC20 host, and we'll lose our, our normal cellular connection to the internet. And by having that LAN connectivity, we're able to still browse the internet on our phones and show that uh, on the screen as well simultaneously. And then that final cable was obviously the power um, that we need to, to run that host unit there. Um, so this is a really quick overview of WDC20 and some of the really cool features that we've, we've built into that product now. And uh, we'll just hand it back over to the guys there. And I think we're going to head into Q&A. Um, so back over to Dan and Bajoy. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much, Joy, uh, for that great uh, presentation. So Joy is our uh, field application engineer based in Sydney office as well. Um, 
So if uh, you've got any questions, technical questions, uh, whether it be security or hardware, whatever it may be, just throw any questions down into the Q&A uh, at any time now. Uh, just mute Jai there. Um, not that I don't want him to talk, but uh, all right. So we actually do have uh, one question that did pop up throughout that, uh, that particular presentation. So uh, Bajoy, um, will the phone go in landscape mode as well as portrait if yeah. we're sharing? It, it goes in both. So basically you'll just need to rotate your phone once you start casting or once you start wirelessly presenting. So you can go into both landscape and the portrait mode. So it works well. Yeah. So essentially it just works on the, the, the gyroscope or the, uh, the metrics of the phone. Yes. Essentially. Yes. It, it just depends on how you, how you tilt the phone and stuff like that. So that's how it works yeah. there. Yeah. Beautiful. While we uh, wait for a couple more in the Q&A, um, uh, John, I might uh, throw a question at you, um, if, you if I can grab you again. Yep. Uh, we, we talked about a lot about the, the devices at home and the vulnerabilities that are particularly plaguing the, the end user or the, or the employee. Um, and obviously, the network's based around where they're conducting their business. But what, what do you think is the is the biggest sort of threat vector or the threat vulnerabilities that are actually in sort of inside enterprise? So inside of the meeting room, inside of a corporate office or inside of a, of a network, uh, what do you see being the biggest threat there? Uh, look, this is an interesting question because I see this in organizations all around the world and it's actually got absolutely nothing to do with the technology itself at all. Uh, it's physical security. You know, the number of times, I'll, I'll give you an example, and there's the, the new Commonwealth Bank headquarters that has been built at Darling Harbour, and there's a foot traffic bridge that goes right past that. And every morning as you're walking uh, from Sydney City over that foot traffic bridge to Darling Harbour, there's a massive boardroom sitting there in that Commonwealth Bank building, and you can see them all sitting there madly scribbling on the whiteboard and talking about all the different things that they're doing. Some of the stuff that I have seen on that whiteboard would literally make your stuff hair turn white, all right? Uh, and it's the same at Microsoft. I've walked past buildings at Microsoft in Redmond, in Washington, in the US. Again, massive boardrooms with these huge glass windows there, and they're writing high-level, highly secure stuff up on the boardroom whiteboard in front of windows, you know? So if you're talking about security, people sometimes, especially when they're talking about IT security, become so focused on the, the threats and vulnerabilities and attack vectors from an IT perspective, like malware and ransomware and viruses and things like that, they forget about the simple physical vulnerabilities. There's an old anecdote very quickly about, you know, the security manager and the chief information officer sitting down at a company having lunch. And the, chief inf the security manager says to the chief information officer, I can steal all of the information on your server uh, by lunchtime today. And the chief information officer says, no way, you can't. We've got the best antivirus. We've got the best firewalls. There's no way you are getting through our security. And he's like, all right, job's on. If I can get through by lunch today, you owe me dinner. So, okay, no worries. They go out. He walks back into the office. He pulls the fire alarm. Everyone goes freaking and running out of the building. He walks into the server room, pulls the entire server out of the rack and walks out of the building. Didn't need to hack the firewall at all. So, don't forget your physical security as well as your IT security. And that's a great point, John, because when we're talking about InstaShow, it's a hardware solution. So we're really taking out a lot of that human element when it comes to putting in passwords and uh, attaching yourself to networks and things like that. If you can plug in a charger to your phone, you can plug in the InstaShow button kit. Uh, Absolutely. So that's that's a really good point. The easier you make it, the, the less human factors involved, the, the greater the propensity for the security to work. Exactly. Um, go ahead, Bajoy. Is it on? It's on. You're on. Okay. Uh, so, John, just one quick question. So, uh, like, have you come across any sort of attacks where, let's say, for example, if my laptop is switched off, it's like it's in shutdown mode. Is there any attack which can probably trigger the laptop on and get the data out of the laptop or is it necessary for a product or let's say for a system to be in switched on mode or even if it's in switched off mode, is, this, is, is there something which can trigger that to an on condition and then retrieve the data? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we know that in the operating system of pretty much every 
uh, device or laptop, there are user management protocols or energy management protocols, which allow you to set wake up times and sleep times for both the device itself and hard drives. So hard drives can spin up when on, on network, wake up and all that sort of stuff. There's a multitude of viruses out there that I won't bore you with all the names that can do the same sort of thing. They can set the computer to wake up at certain times. And this is this is typical of um, what they call a zombie attack, where, you know, uh, what will happen is one of the, uh, uh, let's just say it's a Russian hacking farm somewhere in far off Warp Warp. They infect, uh, you know, a thousand computers and they're not necessarily using those computers to conduct uh, or, or to try and get credit card information or whatever it may be. What they're doing is they're using those computers in a distributed denial of service attack. So you're in bed and you're fast asleep and you've got no idea that your computer's been remotely woken up and being used to attack a particular website. Let's say, I don't know, johnbigelow.com. Um, someone in Russia wants to bring my website down and, and interrupt my traffic. So they infect tens of thousands of computers around the world who are all bombarding my website with traffic simultaneously until the whole thing overloads and shuts down. And your computer is one of those computers and you've got no idea, you're in bed fast asleep. And by the next morning when you wake up and go back to your laptop, it's all over, it's all done, you know nothing about it. Yeah. So, John, I've got a, a, another question, sort of based on my, my first one, I mean, about the vulnerabilities in the in the meeting room we we talked about the the human element of it but if yep. you if you had to say through your experience what how vulnerable are internal networks of corporations um to 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 remote attacks or to even local attacks so there's a, a widely publicized story from a couple of years ago about uh, a breach of target we're all familiar with target the retail chain um, someone managed to get into their FPOS system and steal all of their customer data relating to transactions and credit card numbers and all the rest of it. And it didn't come from Target. It actually came from the HVAC suppliers, so heating, ventilation and air conditioning, the people who were contracted to actually go and do all of that work for Target. They had vulnerabilities in their IT system. Someone managed to figure that out. And by infecting their computers, they then found a backdoor through into Target and then got into Target's financial systems and managed to rip through Target. So this is what I was talking about before with knowing whether or not you've changed your default username and password on your home router and all that sort of stuff. I mean, being giving them access to the default username and password won't necessarily enable, enable them to get into your home network, but it makes it that one step easier. And you've got no idea who's living next door to you. So what if they're getting onto your network and getting up to all sorts of funny business using your internet connection to do things out in the rest of the world that you don't even know about? So, you know, that's why when you're looking at things like InstaShow and all the rest of it, it doesn't matter whether or not your computer's been compromised unless your computer's executing some sort of, you know, action that you're not aware of. But by taking that out of the network, you remove those vulnerabilities. Yeah, look, it's a, it's a scary thing because it's, it doesn't matter how secure you are as an individual, as an employee, as an IT manager, it's, it, it's a collective approach and it's so easy to, to find mm. these vulnerabilities when you know it's what they are. Everyone's responsibility, I would say. Like it is, but it's, every, you know... Yeah, every individual has, has your own responsibility to take care of their own system, which in turn yep. they take care of a, a corporate system, I would say. Yeah, 100%. Collective approach. Yeah. Yep. Um, John, I suppose in in wrapping up, I, I um, seeing as that you're you're heavily involved with the Australian Security Industry Association, and you do the podcast for them, which is the Security Insider. What is what's on the cards for for that organisation? Are they seeing what what are they seeing on the horizon? What what are we what are we working towards as far as the the industry goes in in cybersecurity? So they've obviously just, uh, to the best of my understanding, entered into a memorandum of understanding with ISACA, which is uh, the largest IT security association around at the moment. They're also, I believe, doing some work with um, uh, another association. I think it's IC ISC Squared, which is a big testing organization that um, basically certifies IT security professionals. But it's that convergence that we've been seeing going on for the last decade or two between physical and cybersecurity. 
you know, those two have traditionally up until now been very siloed and kept separate. You had physical security over here and IT security over here. But I think it's getting harder and harder to try and keep those two apart. And so as more and more of the systems go online, more and more of those traditionally physical security systems like CCTV, access control, intrusion detection, and so on, all migrate into that digital space through IP cameras and digital networks and all the rest of it. That's playing more of a role in the IT space because they're sharing the same network. So that convergence is going to be a big thing and has been a big thing up until now, but that's going to continue to get stronger and stronger and stronger as we move forward, especially as we start to move into things like smart buildings and smart cities and all those sorts of things. Yeah, look, it's it's an exciting time and it's a scary time. Everything's going online and and everything's getting smart, including a lot of our products as well, <laughs> Bajoy. Uh, yeah. So we we have to keep up with it as well. Uh, but um, but I, look, I, if you have anything else, Bajoy, did uh, you? No, I, I I don't think of like I can't think of anything at the moment. I think that John's covered a lot today. Yeah, John's, and, um, John's gone through a major chunk of what are the <laughs> yeah. the usual things that we always get asked and what are the usual vulnerabilities that we come across. So I guess John's pretty much covered most of it. I think he's done a, and a, he's exceeded our expectations on <laughs> that. So, <laughs> so with that, I just want to say thank you very much, Thanks, John. John. Uh, thank you really uh, for being here with us and taking the time and, and, and uh, sharing your knowledge with us because uh, the more knowledge we can have, the, the more secure we can stay in the, at home, in the workplace, at school, wherever you may be. So yeah. we really appreciate your time, John. And also I really appreciate everybody else's time who, logged in today uh, for the webinar and, and uh, spent some time with us today. Thanks to, to Jai, our field applic application engineer, and we've got uh, Bajoy here, our uh, projector product manager. So thank you to everyone. Uh, I'm going to put in some uh, links into the chat uh, where you can find uh, John's website. You can find some more products about uh, some more information about uh, BenQ products. But if you want to get in, in touch with us, just go to the, the BenQ Australia website, so the benq.com.au and click the business uh, link at the top left and then you'll go into the business display site and you can get in touch with us through there but feel free to uh, reach out to any of your uh, BenQ representatives or your resellers who sell BenQ and uh, eventually it will get definitely get back to us uh, also the webinar today is being recorded so we'll upload this to the BenQ Australia YouTube channel and also share the link with you guys so if you did happen to miss it or you'd like to watch it again or share it around to your colleagues please feel free to do that uh, so with that, again, thank you very much to everyone and thank, thank you. you to John and we'll see you on the next webinar.